Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Creative Blindness and How to Cure It by Dave Trott. This is a non-fiction book, it's pretty much on the subject of creativity, and it kind of offers you a bunch of different ways that you can think outside the box, to use the cliched phrase, which he'd hate. Uh, so I'm going to start by reading you the blurb. Uh, what I will say before I get into that, actually, Trott has a very unique writing style. Trot has a very unique writing style. He, he writes in these like short sentences, as you'll see when I do my uh, readings from it. And that's why I want to read from it as well. Um, so basically, I've just highlighted a bunch of the different sections and the stories within. And the, and the full book just has more of those, you know? Creativity is all around us. Not in art galleries, but on the train, at work, in the street outside, and in schools, hospitals, and restaurants. Creative vision exists wherever people are. In this entertaining collection of real-life stories, Dave Trott applies his crystal-clear lens to define what genuine creative vision looks like. It is problem-solving, clarity of thought, seeing what others do not see, and removing complexity to make things as simple as you can. The timeless lessons revealed here can be applied in advertising, business, and throughout everyday life. By seeing things differently, you can think differently and change the world around you. Dave Trott shows you how. So yeah. So we're going to jump right in with the introduction here. Introduction, corkscrew thinking. At the lowest point of the war, Winston Churchill said the only thing that would save us was corkscrew thinkers. People who thought differently. We had less soldiers, fewer. Less tanks, fewer. Less planes, fewer. Less of everything, okay, than the enemy. If we carried on thinking in the conventional straight line way, we must lose. So we needed people who didn't think in the conventional straight line way. We needed corkscrew thinkers. People who could approach a problem inside out. People who could look at a problem and see it as an opportunity. What we would now call creative thinkers. Churchill's corkscrew thinkers gave us Bletchley Park, being there earlier this year, which cracked the unbreakable Enigma code and won the Battle of the Atlantic. They gave us the Sten gun, made from bicycle pumps by a children's toy manufacturer. They gave us anti-shipping mines made from gobstoppers, which sank Japanese warships. They gave us a bomber without guns, made of wood, which the enemy couldn't catch. They gave us an inflatable army made of balloons, which fooled the Germans about where the D-Day invasion would happen. They gave, us a dead body washed... they gave us a dead body washed ashore with secret information, which caused the enemy to move its forces to a harmless location. Luckily for us, the enemy didn't seem to have any corkscrew thinkers. They didn't think they needed them. So that was our secret weapon, corkscrew thinking, aka creativity. But where do you find corkscrew thinkers? Can you hire them, or is it possible to learn it? Well, like, any, well, like everything, the answer is yes if you want to. Creativity is all around us. We can choose to see it or ignore it. We can exercise our creative muscle just as we can exercise any other muscle. If we don't exercise it, it atrophies and dies. But if we do exercise it, it grows stronger and stronger. So what we need to do is learn to spot the creativity around us everywhere. At work, on the train, at breakfast, in the street, at dinner, in the shops. As we begin to spot it, we see it everywhere. We can learn to discuss it, to argue about it, to disagree, to reinterpret. And pretty soon creativity comes into conversations with others. Pretty soon we can influence them into spotting it too. We have a working creative muscle. That's where this book should help you get started. On all the different ways you can experience it. All the different places you can find it. And none of it is in art galleries. Real creativity doesn't live in specialist museums for dead art. Real creativity is alive, happening everywhere, every day. That's why Churchill said corkscrew thinkers were his secret weapon. That's why Bill Birnbach said, it may well be that creativity is the last unfair advantage we're legally allowed to take over the competition. Creativity, once you've learned to spot it, is your legal unfair advantage. Okay, when the problem is the opportunity. Dixon Chibanda is one of only 12 psychiatrists in Zimbabwe, but Zimbabwe is a country of 14 million, so this makes the ratio one psychiatrist to every one million people. Obviously, this doesn't work very well. Several years back, Dixon got a phone call from a village 200 kilometers away, a young woman needing psychiatric help. He told her to come to his practice in Harare to see him. A few weeks later, her mother called to say the young woman had committed suicide. Dixon asked why she hadn't come to see him. The mother said they couldn't afford the $15 bus fare. That's when he realised the problem needed a creative solution. The medical term is General Anxiety Disorder, or GAD, defined as six months or more of chronic, exaggerated, unfounded worry and tension. I have that, by the way. Young women were suffering in villages all over Zimbabwe. So Dixon Japanda did what creative people do. He turned the problem into an opportunity. Because there was something else in all those villages. Grandmothers. 
Grandmothers who all wanted someone to talk to, as well as young women who needed someone to listen to them. Dixon began training grandmothers very broadly in cognitive behavioural therapy, where the patient and the practitioner solve the problem together. He describes it as evidence-based talk therapy. The Zimbabwean word for depression is kufungisisa, which literally means thinking too much. The main thing the grandmothers had to learn was listening. Dixon Chibanda's brilliant innovation was the friendship bench, an open-air wooden bench where a young woman could talk to a grandmother. It was cheap and easy to construct in villages all over Zimbabwe, and the informality made it more accessible, much less intimidating to the young women. Dixon now has 70 friendship benches in different communities across Zimbabwe. Typically, a treatment will consist of six one-to-one -one sessions, with a week between each. Hundreds of grandmothers have treated 70,000 patients, and the young women are five times less likely to have suicidal thoughts as a result. The grandmothers are more effective at treating depression than doctors are, and the young woman remains symptom-free six months after treatment. Right. The results of the clinical trial have been published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. After six months, depression in the control group was 50%, but among friendship bench users, it was 14%. Depression among those receiving standard care was 48%, but among friendship bench users it was 12%. Suicidal thoughts were 12% among those receiving standard care, but among friendship bench users it was 2%. Dixon says the grandmothers are supported and networked through digital platforms, which just means Zimbabwe's 12 trained psychiatrists can use mobile phones to confer with grandmothers in any village, however remote. Dixon says there are currently 600 million grandmothers above age 65 worldwide, who would, all, who would love to feel useful and needed. At the same time they could be helping to solve the problems of young people. At the same time they could be helping to solve the problems of young women in poor and underdeveloped societies who don't have access to psychiatrists. Putting two problems together to create a solution is what creative people do. So it's almost it reminds me a little bit of reading Aesop's fables which I've been doing as uh, my bedtime read. Some of these I'm just going to paraphrase here but um this one here is uh, called Two Minuses Can Make a Plus, and it's basically about how uh, stray dogs tend to get euthanized. And uh, so in the US, uh, there's a program where they're like adopted by death row inmates, and then the death row inmates kind of retrain the dogs, and it gives them a new lease on life as well. Um, yeah, this one I really like, so I'm going to read the full one here. If you can't stop it, steer it. Each year, a group of neo-Nazis march through a small German town. They march to the grave of Rudolf Hess, Hitler's deputy. The townspeople hate the neo-Nazis in the march. They've tried everything they can to get the march stopped. They've asked the local council to ban it. They've tried protest marches of their own, but nothing works. Neo-Nazis come from all over to march the kilometre to the cemetery. Fascist groups are a real problem in Germany. They attract the angry and disaffected youths. The kids who have no jobs and no prospects. This is a major worry for their parents and friends who feel powerless to stop them joining. So the local community has formed a group called Exit to help educate and de-radicalise young people to encourage them to leave the group and help them find better lives. But Exit needs funding. So, so the townspeople have decided, since they can't stop the neo-Nazis marching, to use the march for their own ends. Instead of resisting the march, they are now encouraging the march because they are using the march to raise money. For every metre the neo-Nazis march, local businesses are donating 10 euros to Exit. So the, so the neo-Nazis will now be marching to fund Exit. The further they march, the more money Exit gets. If the neo-Nazis don't like it, they can stop marching. Whichever way they decide, it's a result for the local community. Whether the neo-Nazis march or not, the little village wins. The inhabitants now treat the march as something to enjoy and have fun with. Every hundred metres there are signs stenciled on the ground, thanking the marchers for the money they're raising. You have raised 1,000 euros for Exit. You have raised 2,000 euros for Exit. You have raised 3,000 euros for Exit. And so on. By the time the neo-Nazis reach the cemetery, they've marched a kilometre, which means they've raised 10,000 euros for exit. So there is a huge rainbow sign thanking them, and the locals throw rainbow confetti over them. The locals also have fun at the neo-Nazis' expense. Halfway along, the, halfway along the march, there is a huge table of bananas as snacks for the marchers. Above it is a poster saying Mein Kampf, this means my hunger, and is a play on Hitler's autobiography, Mein Kampf, meaning my struggle. Because the situation has been reversed, the neo-Nazis are now marching against themselves. The beauty is it's all perfectly legal and non-confrontational. If the marchers carry on doing what they want, the village wins. If the marchers stop doing what they want, the village wins. The villagers couldn't stop them marching, so they change what they're marching for. If you've got a problem you can't solve, get upstream and change it into a problem you can solve. That's creative thinking. Okay, this one's uh, for my bookish peeps, which is obviously all of you. This one is, our job isn't a summary. In 1953, an unknown writer called William Golding wrote a novel. He sent it to around 20 publishers, one after the other, and one after the other it came back. 
The rejection letters used phrases like absurd, uninteresting, and rubbish and dull. Eventually, a young editor at Faber and Faber read it. Charles Monteith liked the book. He agreed to pay £60 for it, but it needed changes. Golding agreed the suggestions improved the book. But Monteith's big problem was with the title. The book was called Strangers From Within. Monteith thought this was dull, and he asked Golding to think of a new title. The story was about children on an island, so Golding wrote a list of possibilities. Island Impact, Hunt the Island, They Came to an Island, Island Refuge, Offspring of an Island, The Foster Island, Beast in the Jungle, The Isle is Full of Noises, Fun and Games, Beast on the Island, Trouble Island, The Beast on Coral Island, Island Trouble, Island Story, My Island, Let's Play Islands, Smoke on the Island, New Coral Island, Coral Island Renewed, Nightmare Island, The Island's Mine, An Island of Their Own. All these titles summarise what the book was about, children on an island, but Monty thought they were all dull. Then another young editor came up with a title that wasn't a summary of the contents of the book. Alan Pringle realised the job of the title wasn't to encapsulate the story, the job of the title was to provoke the reader. To summarise the mood of the story, but in a way that made it sound intriguing. In short, the main job was to make the reader want to read it. He suggested the title, Lord of the Flies. It didn't mention islands, or hunting, or trouble, or beasts, or children. It didn't fill any of the requirements of encapsulating the story. But it did capture the mood in a way that sounded gripping and unsettling. The book went on to sell many millions and is now a set text in the school curriculum. It's worth remembering the lesson of that title. When conventional wisdom says our job is to summarise the contents or the ingredients or the consumer insight or the brand, remember our job isn't any of those things. Our job is to stand out, to provoke, to get noticed and get remembered. Our job is impact. There was a story here about um, an Afro-Caribbean man who discovered that not enough Afro-Caribbean men were um, getting their prostates checked. And um, so he he uh, owned a garage. So he offered people, I think it was like 50% off their MOT if they got their pr prostates checked. And uh, saved a bunch of lives by doing it. This one I want to read out just because um, it lets me swear a lot. <laughs> so this is Who's a Naughty Boy then. This is uh, the first one of Section 3, Part 3, uh, Creative Impact. Warwickshire Wildlife Sanctuary is a very peaceful place. Well, it was until the mayor's wife visited the newest addition, Barney the Parrot. As she came closer to inspect the parrot's beautiful plumage, Barney saw her gold chains and regalia. He said, You can fuck off. Everyone hoped it was a mistake, a one-off, something the bird had said by accident. Until the next day when the local vicar arrived. Barney took one look at his dog collar and said, You can fuck off and all. The parrot was reported to the authorities. Two policemen came to investigate. Barney looked them over and said, fuck off wankers. The policeman said Barney was a threat to public decency. It'd have to be moved away from the children and the elderly. So he was placed in a quieter part of the sanctuary. This worked well until a troop of brownies happened to see him. The little girls were fascinated by his pretty colours, but when Barney saw their uniforms, he shrieked bollocks and kept repeating bollocks until they went away. Barney had to be put in solitary confinement. People were only allowed to see him by special request and had to be 18 or over. Barney had been donated to the sanctuary by a lorry driver who was moving to Spain. The lorry driver kept Barney in the same room as his TV set. The lorry driver hated any sort of authority. Whenever anyone in uniform came on TV, he said exactly what he thought of them, which is where Barney picked up his language skills. Gref Gr Jeff Grucock, amazing name for this story as well, who was in charge of the sanctuary, wanted to reform Barney. He thought he'd teach him the natural language of his species. So he put two African grey parrots, Sam and Charlie, in the same pen as Barney. But it didn't quite work out as Jeff intended. Instead of Sam and Charlie teaching Barney, it transpired the other way round. Now, Jeff said, the pen sounds like a builder's yard, with all three parrots sh screeching fuck and bollocks at each other. It seems Barney the parrot did pretty much everything wrong. He's naughty, he's outrageous, he's a bad boy. And yet Barney is the only bird at Warwickshire Wildlife Sanctuary that's ever been written about in the national press. Barney has had articles in The Guardian, Telegraph, Times and on the BBC. In fact, Barney has put the Warwickshire Wildlife Sanctuary on the map. Visitor numbers soared, and who do you think everyone wants to see? Here's a clue. It's not all the perfectly behaved birds that are exactly like all the other birds in every other wildlife sanctuary. It's the one who's naughty, who's done everything he shouldn't do. The one who isn't like any other bird at any of the other sanctuaries. Because people aren't interested in the same old thing they could get anywhere else. What fascinates people is what's different, what's interesting, what's controversial. And sometimes to be different, you have to be a bit naughty, a bit outrageous, instead of obeying all the rules like everyone else. Which is a really good lesson for all of us who work in advertising. If we don't want to be ignored, we could all do with being a bit less obedient. A bit less like the mayor's wife and the vicar, and a bit more like Barney the parrot. 
There's a story called Show Don't Tell, which I think, again, is one of the main lessons that writers have, so it kind of applies across different uh, industries and genres here. But basically, the London Underground, nobody was going on the escalators because they thought they were unsafe. So, uh, oh, let me find his name, actually. The Underground hired a man with one leg to ride up and down it. Uh, what's his name? William Bumper Harris. He was an employee who'd lost a leg in an accident. So they paid him to go up and down, and then everybody realised, well, if a man with a wooden leg can go up and down on an escalator, so can I. Uh, story called Advertising is Bollocks. This is about a guy who, um, his local council wasn't taking potholes seriously, so he spray-painted them and turned them into, like, cartoon penises. And then, obviously, the council was like, oh, that's an affront to public decency. So they went and filled the potholes in and removed the graffiti. Uh, there's a story about Julius Caesar as well that basically he got captured and he demanded his own ransom was way higher than um, what they, the, his captors would have asked for and that had the effect of like back in Rome everyone was like well who's this Caesar guy he must be impressive if he's worth all this money and here we have part four practical creativity I think I'll read this one out this is triage thinking in TV hospital dramas you'll see a patient rushed in on a stretcher while a nurse yells get this patient to triage I thought triage must be a medical term for emergency, but I was wrong. In fact, it can mean almost the opposite. It turns out triage is a French wartime expression. After any major battle, there were far more wounded than, than there were medical staff to treat them. So the wounded were quickly sorted into three groups. Those that will die whatever you do. Those that will live whatever you do. Those that will only live if you treat them. Then all available attention is quickly given to the third group. Because, att because attention given to the first two groups would be wasted. Triage comes from the French verb trier, meaning to sort or sift. You can't treat everyone, so sort out where your effort will make a difference and concentrate there. For me, this has always been a principle of life in general, and advertising in particular. Years before I ever heard the term triage, I quickly decide whether the effort I'm about to make will be wasted or not. If it will, I don't do it. I save it for somewhere it won't be wasted. Take students, for instance. I quickly have to decide whether I can help them. Not everyone wants to hear what I've got to say, Many of them already know the answer they want to hear. So instead of wasting time going through their portfolio honestly, I'm polite and get it over with as quickly as possible. I can't make a difference, so I don't try. I save it for a student where I can make a difference. It's the same with clients. Many of them don't want to hear what I've got to say. It's too simplistic, it's not the answer they want. So instead of trying to argue them into it, I don't go to that meeting, it would be counterproductive. Better to use my time with clients where I can make a difference. Triage thinking makes particular sense when doing advertising. It would be a waste to randomly talk to everyone everywhere. The market is too big and our resources are too small. So keep it simple. Use triage thinking. There are usually three groups. One, people that won't buy whatever we say, call non-users. Two, people that will buy whatever we say, call users. And three, people where our advertising might make a difference. It doesn't make sense to waste our resources against the first two groups. So we concentrate all our resources against the third group. We put all our effort where it will make a difference. It seems so obvious, it's amazing everyone doesn't do it. It's just what smart people have always done. It's a basic principle in sport, business, warfare, relationships, in anything. Put our resource where it will make a difference. Don't waste it where it can't. This is simple triage. It's another name for creativity. Uh, there's one here called Thinking on the Fly, and uh, this was basically local authorities were having a lot of problems with fly tippers, uh, like people putting posters up for their events, and they discovered that the best way to stop them doing it was to put a new, their own sticker on top of it saying cancelled, as opposed to like paying loads of money to get them cleaned up and stuff. They just did that for a while, and then people stopped putting posters up. Uh, a story called Backfire, and it's about how um, the NRA, basically, uh, they, they, they spent loads of money helping Trump to get elected. And actually, it didn't really work for them because gun sales were higher during Obama's presidency because the future of gun ownership was unclear, so people sort of stockpiled them. So sometimes things are kind of counterintuitive. Uh, There's a story about the woman who burned herself on um, hot coffee from McDonald's. There's actually a really interesting documentary called Hot Coffee that's worth checking out. And uh, this is the last one that I wanted to read out, uh, and I thought this was just interesting because I myself have invested in both the stock exchange and cryptocurrency, and made okay-ish money from both of them as well, so it's called Going Ape Shit. How intelligent do you have to be to invest on the stock exchange? You have to really know what you're doing, right? You can't just throw darts at a list of companies on the wall. You wouldn't let a chimpanzee pick out your stocks and shares, or would you? How about if a chimpanzee threw darts at a list of companies? Well, in 1999, a chimpanzee throwing darts at a list of companies was the, second, was the 22nd most successful investor on Wall Street. 
the six-year-old chimpanzee beat 6,000 mutual funds, showing a 213% gain. It doubled the performance of the Dow Jones. It quadrupled the performance of the Nasdaq. Roland, Roland Perry, editor of Internet Stock Review, set up Monkey Dex. The chimpanzee would throw darts at a list of 133 internet companies and, over the year, those investments showed returns of 365%. So that leaves a question, why doesn't everyone invest that way? The answer is, it was the time of the dot-com boom. From, from 1990 to 1997, internet penetration of US households went from 15% to 35%. Suddenly, any company with dot-com after its name was gold dust. The investor's mantra was growth over profit. Day traders were in the grip of buy low, sell high mania. But then, like all bubbles, it burst. In 2000, the Nasdaq peaked, but two years later it was down by 78%. Between March 2000 and October 2002, the market lost $5 trillion. 52% of those dot-coms were out of business by 2004. But the lesson isn't about the market, it's about people. In a bull market, when everything is going up, any idiot can make money. Even a chimpanzee throwing darts at a list stuck on the wall. Like any bubble, it's just everyone jumping on the bandwagon. But a bull market doesn't last forever. It's followed by a bear market when everything goes down. When everyone is desperate to jump off the bandwagon before they lose everything. The phenomenon that causes bubbles is called FOMO, fear of missing out. This is the result of an entire news industry built on reporting news. Free newspapers twice a day, a dozen 24-hour TV news channels, hundreds of news websites, news radio stations. Their product is news and they need a constant supply. So, if there isn't any news, they have to create some news. Whatever the latest wacky fad is, it has to be treated like real news. And gullible people, reading or watching, will believe it is real news. Which is how all the latest trivial fads get blown out of all proportion. This is exactly what happens in advertising and marketing, FOMO. Of course, we have to be aware of innovations, but not to the exclusion of common sense. We have to learn to think for ourselves and use our brains instead of following the herd. The current FOMO fad is cryptocurrencies, initial coin offerings. According to token data, the ICO tracker, 46% of ICOs launched last year have already failed and another 13% are in the process of failing. That's $233 million flushed down the drain because of FOMO. Which is why my favourite quote about investing is from Warren Buffett. He said, A market downturn is like the tide going out. It's easy to see who isn't wearing swimming trunks. So all in all, I think as you can tell, I quite enjoyed this. I'd give it a, a 4 out of 5. I think there's some really interesting stuff on the subject of creativity. And uh, the cool thing about it is that you can kind of take the lessons you learn from it and apply it to your wider life, you know. So um, definitely would recommend if you get a chance to read it. So there we have it. That's what I made of Creative Blindness by Dave Trott. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.